and uh, welcome to Vulture Festival. Uh, my name is Jackson McHenry, and I am a senior writer at Vulture. Um, and with me here, I have Tony Shaloub, who plays Abe Weissman, and Maren Hinkle. Thank you, thank you. Um, and we are very excited to get to talk a little bit about playing the parents on Mrs. Maisel, and just Abe and Rose have been through so much, as we've already seen from that clip reel. Um, and I wanted to know first, I mean, both of you are sort of from the worlds of, of theater and television. How well did you know each other before playing these two characters? I was sort of, is this on okay? You guys, oh, you can hear me, okay. Um, that's my theater training, right? And to get it all out to y'all. Um, I was kind of madly obsessed with this guy. So everything that I could in New York that he was in, I went to see, but he didn't know me at all. So I was like that fan that was not exactly a stalker, but a little bit of a stalker. So when I heard he was doing the show, because he was cast first on it, I think um, my agents mentioned it and I heard it and I was like, how can I get an audition? So I, I didn't really, really know him, but I was obsessed. I didn't, uh, I, I did not know Amarin. Uh, I had never met her, but I did take out a restraining order. Uh, <laughs> so that, that became yes. necessary. You know, and a great dynamic to really build a foundation for collaborators on. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, but Amy and Dan uh, Palladino are so known for being, building such particular worlds, and these, these characters come from such a specific slice of Upper West Side Jewish New York life. I was wondering how they sort of initially described them and their dynamic to you, how to, what sort of what clicked for you when you were first kind of figuring out how to play them. Um, I remember there was a description um, of character of Rose in the pilot that I was auditioning for that said, I think I was supposed to be wearing uh, one of my robes and it was like a feather boa kind of pink rose robe. And I think it said that I enter the room as if in an MGM musical. And I thought, okay, how am I gonna get this role? So I went to a, I'll, I'll make this real short. I went to like a Halloween costume shop or something. And I don't tell them this, but I actually got costumes and like take, took some of them off and like reworked them and sewed them. I mean, I'm not even a clever, you know, crafty person, but I did that for the audition and then I donned a wig and I don't wear like makeup in real life but I really went for it I was like with Amy and Dan that they have such a level of perfection that I thought I'm not gonna have any part of me that doesn't say like I exactly will give you everything of myself in the role and then I was asked to fly again Tony got the role without doing any of this but um, I basically had to fly into New York back and forth and back and forth each time attempting to prove to them that I, I, I could I could be Rose but it worked. I, yeah, <laughs> true. I, I can't even imagine doing this part without Marin uh, as, a, as a cohort and as a foil. Uh, it's really, it, it, that, I think of, when I think of Rose and I think of this family that Amy and Dan created, I just think it, it sort of all flows down from Marin, really. That's so sweet, and I'm no. gonna turn the compliment around and say <laughs> there's, a, one of the things I had noticed in my obsession with him was that there's certain actors that can travel, I'm like crying, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but I'm crying with appreciation and love, and there's certain actors that can travel through time, not all can do that, right? We love so many movie stars and they're, they're there in a contemporary way and if you put them in a classical piece, you kind of go, this doesn't quite feel right. But I had seen Tony like in the Dark Ages or Chekhovian or you know whatever he was doing, if it was Arthur Miller, and he could just transform into whatever in musicals. The guy won like the best Tony for the musical he did. And so he literally, he, he, he can do any time period in any kind of personage. I know there's all this, you know, talk about what being an actor is. It's the idea of playing, right? Having fun and, and making sure that you can expand self. And so that's what's so great about what Amy and Dan recognized in this one, is that he's gonna be the masterful person that's gonna travel through the, you know, historical time back to the 1950s. Working with him is, is perfection, and the same is true with every single cast member. It's like, I guess by Amy and Dan choosing people that understand the, the love of, of creating a historical dig, it allows you to feel like you, you really are, are there back with them. Uh, to answer your question, uh, in terms of my character, I think uh, on my early conversations with Amy and Dan um, kind of revolved around uh, 
this, I this idea that, you know, this was a show about a young woman who, who pursues the life of a stand-up comic, even though she's never done that before. But, but really, they said that the emphasis uh, was uh, if equally, if not more so, on the idea of uh, family in this, t in this era uh, and, and what that, you know, how we could illustrate and billboard uh, the role of women at this time and how that was changing and what it meant to be a man and a father and a breadwinner, uh, you know, and the, the, uh, the, the ideal situa situation would be to marry off his oldest, you know, his daughter uh, so that she was taken care of. And so, so this idea, this notion that it was a as much about family. Mm -hmm. I was wondering also, were there any people who you thought of as real life, Abes and Roses, who you've met, who you sort of helped inspire these characters, or people who knew real life Abes and Roses as sort of of the other era? Uh, well, I, just speaking for myself, because I'm years old, <laughs> uh, you know, I was growing up, I was a young kid uh, during this, the time of our show, and so, you know, I, I kind of, channel my own father and uh, uncles and friends of my father and um, and and that sort of again that sort of dynamic about how men women housewives children all of that worked so um, so I had a kind of a you know a model or a template to uh, to work off of I think um, it's funny, we were asked earlier today which of uh, the two of us are closer to our characters, and I definitely think, I almost want to ask you all, but you don't know us, so I guess you couldn't answer it, but it's definitely him that's closer to his character. I am not like Rose in that she's very strong, she puts herself together beautifully, I'm a mess, I walk around as if I'm a bag lady, and so basically when they create this whole thing, it takes a lot of work, but um, wait, what was the question again? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Real life uh, yeah. yes. Uh, but anyway, what I was going to say, wait, what is the question? The real life people who sort yeah, of. So the real life people in my life. So I kind of went the opposite in my own life of people like my mom, my mother-in-law, my teachers. I was a dancer and all my ballet teachers. And then I went to graduate school. These women were leaders. They were fierce. And I kind of was this insecure person that was always looking for affirmation. Rose, it feels like, has her own sense of affirmation. And I love that I get to play someone so different from myself. I get to travel into a place of strength and then as soon as like they call like cut, then I go back to my own worries, you know? Rose doesn't have so many about herself. I do. Yeah. Well, speaking of Rose being so much her own person, I feel like a big pivot point for these characters is the beginning of season two where you go off to Paris. Um, and I was wondering first, what did you make of that sort of side of her character where she's suddenly like, I need to escape this world. I need to go do my own thing. It seems so initially so out of character. It's delicious. You know, Tony brought up earlier the idea of this piece as having kind of, it, it's, it's a feminist piece of work, right? And I had thought that Rachel and a Alex's character were the ones that would, would be sort of the only ones we'd think of that way. But in, in the end, it's every single woman in the show has it. Uh, a, a rebirth, a discovery of self, a kind of way to, uh, to make a pivot in their own lives from where they were headed to where they want. And when they called me and said, do you speak French between our first and second years? I was like, uh, un petit. And then they sent me all these verbs to learn, but they never told me what was going to happen. And it was about only a day before we started shooting that we got the script. Yeah. And they sent us on a plane to Paris. The entire thing was like magic from beginning to end. I, of course, ate more bread and croissant than I've ever done. And I fell in love with every single French man walking around, you know, with his baguette. But basically, it was, it was an incredible dream not just for Marin, but for Rose to sort of find herself over there. And also, when Tony's character says, we're going back home, I felt like wringing his neck and saying, there's no way we can go back home. Yeah, Tony, for you, did that experience help understand Abe? Because it also, you understand that the character's sort of sentimentality in a bit, sort of the extent of his love for Rose. Absolutely. Um, because, uh, you know, these two characters, uh, you know, leading up to se season one and all, all of that, um, leading up to the start of our show, you know, we're living, you know, fairly conventional Upper West Side, you know, uh, existence. And, and then this, this sort of prison break that 
Rose, you know, pulls off in season two, uh, it, 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 it sort of shakes, uh, it, it wakes Abe up and the ground under his feet begin, uh, begins to shift and open up. And um, he realizes, uh, you know, he does, he's not in control of, ever, of his life as he thought he was. He's not in control of his, of his marriage. And, and uh, he needs her and, and ca really cannot exist uh, or continue without her. Yes, he agrees to, that their life may, you know, is going to have to change it in a, in a way, but, but he's not capable. He, he finds that he's not capable of, of uh, being independent. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and during that trip to, to Paris, during those episodes, there's a lovely moment where they reunite and they dance together. Um, and I think we have a clip of you learning the dance in rehearsal, um, if we could play it. Gosh, amazing, really. <laughs> how, how much time? That, did you that only took two weeks, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, how, mu how much time in the rehearsal room did that take? A long time. A, a long time. Every day. Every uh, day for hours mm -hmm. when we weren't shooting. Did they come to you just saying, can you dance? Can you do this? Or sort of what was the initial? They hired a lot of French dancers to teach us that. Yeah. But now what's interesting is, uh, we rehearsed this, and we actually, th this might have been like middle of the rehearsal time, we got it a little tighter and a little smoother, and then when we got to the, to the night of actually, you know, on the Seine uh, with Notre Dame in the background and all of the dancers, Amy, who was directing that episode, decided maybe that was too much. Do you want to try to recreate it to do yeah. the full dance? Could we got to... Um. Uh, this is the, the God's truth, guys, is they told us they wanted us to do this. And so I wrote to Tony and I said, by any chance, did you record it? And it didn't even dawn on me that there was no way the two of us could have recorded it because we were actually dancing that day. But his wife was in Paris with us. So that's actually Brooke's video, correct? Because it couldn't have been you. No. Right. <laughs> so third person, um, yeah. anyway. Good. Yeah, but not that good. So um, this is going to be slightly embarrassing, but we never got to rehearse this, guys, um, before we came out to you. So do you mind if they would never, Amy and Dan would never let us do this to have an I iPhone in the middle of rehearsal, but is it okay if I just hold my iPhone and then maybe we could put the music out? Sure, okay. let's just try. Oh, I'll, I'll, I can grab your microphone. Oh, should I give it to you? Yes. Okay. I can, oh, no, I can't. No, no, I, this hand's involved. <laughs> Okay, we, we've got the sun. We've got, you know, it's very Parisian.
God, amazing, amazing. <laughs> Tony Shalhoub and Martin Hinkle, everybody. Um, Oh my gosh. Um, so you can see why she cut it. Yes, yeah. if uh, we were auditioning, you would never have given us that job. <laughs> oh, no, I think it was wonderful. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> um, well, I mean, what a highlight, how to continue on. Um, but I think after, in the after effects of that, of that trip, going into season two, it seems like Abe and Rose start to just sort of question their lives, question their directions. I think a big part for Abe is when he gets the job at Bell Labs and then realizes it's, it's not what he wants. Um, how did you approach thinking about that part of his character? Well, all of these uh, these plot points, um, you know, are uh, they come kind of come to the actors as a bit of a surprise. Yeah. They, you know, we're not uh, privy to what the writers might be planning, uh, you know, prior to a, the start of a, any given season. So, um, what, but that's kind of what's really great about this show. There's a lot of fi uh, trust in uh, the writers and, and in, uh, among the actors and trust in each other. And so it's, it's kind of uh, exciting, to, exciting to learn that you know, your, your character is gonna make a hard, a hard right turn and you know, maybe try to reinvent uh, themselves. So um, yeah, there's there's a challenging there's a challenging aspect to it, but you never feel you never hit that point where you say, oh, my character wouldn't do that. It's it's it they they transition it so deftly and so perfectly that it's it's just kind of easier. I remember when um, we got a script that said my my character was from Oklahoma with a lot of money. <laughs> I had always imagined that the, that the reason we could have so many gorgeous clothes and that Midge could was probably there was like a secret stash somewhere. So that wasn't a huge surprise, but the whole sort of that part of the country didn't, I had thought she was from New England, like she was kind of like a, a wannabe Catherine Hepburn or something, maybe grew up in Connecticut. And I, but it was kind of delicious to think that she would grow up with cowboy boots and a bunch of brothers and you know none of the stuff that I had imagined. But again, as, as, a, as a human, we never know what our next step is the next day, correct? And so that is interestingly what happens in this particular show is literally you get that script and go, and today's my new day to have a new job or to quit my job or to go live with my in-laws or you know to have an affair. Well, I, that's not what happened by, uh, by the way, but um, but you know what I'm saying? It's always got an extraordinary surprise, which I love. Yeah. Well, that was also such a surprising moment for me because you see Rose go back to her family, meet all these men in her family who are running their trust, who have all this oil money, and then suddenly decide, actually, no, I don't want to deal with you. Actually, I'm going to try to go on my own when you first have met her as someone who's so into the finer things in life. How did you sort of reckon with what, what that decision was for her? I, I personally, I loved that. I love the idea of people cracking open and all that they've spent time creating is now awry. There's something about that. I sort of look out at all you all and think I almost wish that upon you all like maybe after this we're all going to give you a plane ticket to Paris and you redefine self because I do th I do think that there's something about um, about just taking a, a midlife moment to say well hold on now there's a second half what am I going to actually rethink of what I wanted and and what I haven't been able to achieve and I love that Amy and Dan who are by the way around my age, I our age, we're the same age, correct? Yeah. No. Um, but I, I love that they are so in touch, guys, with the fact that it isn't just a young person that can actually make such a, as Tony said, hard right or left, but we can all still do that no matter what age. I think it's, it's key, too, to this notion that, that uh, you know, Rachel uh, Midge, the character of Midge, is really the driver uh, of, of all of this. And so I think in, in some ways, the fact that her life uh, kind of melted down and then started to be rebuilt, uh, in some ways that subliminally or otherwise subconsciously uh, affects Abe and Rose um, and, and shakes up the foundations of their lives. And they, they find this kind, of, uh, this kind of inner strength or courage to, to take some risks in their own lives. And after all, they, this is their child. They, they, she comes from them and they raised her. So there's gotta be a germ of this adventurous spirit in her. And uh, it's reflected back from Midge back onto them. So, so it, it, all, it all sort of is seamless and, 
and fits together in our minds. Yeah, well, I, I was saying, thinking, I mean, by this point, both Abe and Rose have seen Midge do stand-up. Rose, not well, cogent, well, yes, well, after yeah, drinking a little a alcohol um, that she needed for that one. But I was curious for you to film those scenes where you're watching Rachel do stand-up in character and both, you know, reacting very negatively for the most part. Um, what is it like to film those scenes? How do you kind of approach, approach doing that? Oh, I remember that scene in the Catskills when Tony, it, when Abe gets to see her for the first time. It was so exquisite. What was that like for you to watch that? It was, um, it was really kind of shocking, stunning in a way because, mostly because Rachel's performance was so, so kind of elevated and and complicated in that moment of doing her blue act and seeing me in the audience and somehow not feeling a compulsion, not being able to stop herself, but feeling self-conscious and not wanting to wound me, but wanting to demonstrate her strength and her independence. And I, I, I was, as an actor, one actor watching another actor, I was just mesmerized. And I've said this before, I've spoken about this before, that I just thought this was a performance that that scene of hers is, is something that I think acting students will watch years from now because it's so complex and so, I, I, it's, just, it's just inscrutable how she does it. And um, anyway, for me, I didn't have to do much acting because I was stunned by watching her performance. I had, um, when we were in Paris, I was just so, I, every, the whole, the, every single part of it, I was saying earlier to Jackson that one day I went outside, I was a little bleary eyed, we'd been up all night, and I saw something like, over, as if I was looking over at the parking lot, but it was this exquisite, what I thought was a scrim in a scene, like if you're in theater, and I think I said to one of the crew members, and that were the French women, I said, oh my God, it's so beautiful, the scrim, and she's like, no, no, that's, the building. Um, but um, I, I one day was just asking what they were doing at night. I wasn't working. And she was doing that scene, that stand-up scene in Paris that she does, you know, where she gets everything translated. And I went to watch her. And I was, you know, I wasn't really supposed to be there again. And it was the first time Rose Marin had ever, like, been in a place watching her. And I had the same feeling that you're talking about, like, I thought, like, this is a moment where it feels like a historical thing to watch somebody give a performance that is so alive. She never makes a mistake. Every single time she does it, she deepens it. It, it, it is so raw and so alive. That's, it, it, she, she loves working with the real audience. It's not like she says, oh, I don't want to see the audience, and you can layer that in later. She actually says, I want the audience. I want those thousands of people watching me. It's, it's, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. I and mean, Tony, speaking of the Catskills, um, one of the things that I think a lot of the fans of the show has loved is, is Abe's um, calisthenics routine that he does on the dock. Um, and I've, obviously, I, you've already danced. I'm not going to force you to do any more. Um, but I was wondering if you're ever thrown by sort of Amy and Dan coming to you and giving like, oh, this is a new quirk of this character. This is a new thing to kind of throw yourself into. I am, I, as I said, I, I just, whatever they, whatever curveball they throw me, I, I'm, I just, I devour it. I, I relish it, and um, because they have never, they've never steered me wrong, <laughs> and uh, I mean, putting on that romper, um, <laughs> I know it. It was goofy, but it actually, uh, it it when that was like early, uh, mid season two, right? Yes. Uh, you know, it actually, it it advanced my uh, understanding of Abe. Uh, it. You know, it, it broadened my, my view of who this guy was and who he had been. And it, it, it you know, the, the tomato juice, the tomato juice drinking and the, and the romper <laughs> were, and, and also uh, were, were, were really just this great period of growth for me and my understanding of him. And also the drinking. He drinks a little in, you know, when he's home in New York, but in the Catskills, he's really pounding the alcohol, he gets, you know, he gets hammered and he's sort of laying on, the, on his back look, looking at the fireworks. All of those things of him, a man who is very pulled together, but when he's on vacation just pulls out all the stops. Uh, you know, all of those pieces are, are uh, they just inform your understanding of the, the soul of this character. 
Right. Not only should we all go to Paris after we finish today, but the, we should all have two weeks off every summer in the Catskills. That's another thing that feels like a necessity. Don't you agree? Like, every family should be allowed to take time off. They do it in Europe. What's wrong with this country? So, anyway, I, it was so delicious. They really did take us there to a place called, what was it called? Like, it was that place in... in no, no, sorry, in the Catskills. It was a strange name, like... Oh, Deposit? The, deposit. The we were in a place called Deposit, New York. It didn't make a lot of sense that something that sounded so not ex inviting was so delightful. <laughs> um, and then speaking of going into this last season, season three, I think the big consequence of all this change is that they, Rose and Abe have to end up moving out of that apartment, which is such a gorgeous apartment. Speaking of the production design of the show, were you sad to have to leave that set behind? Devastated. <laughs> Devas they had to like pull us from that set. I think I cried. Did you uh, cry? We had a scene. We had to shoot this scene where the apartment was emptied out of furniture, except for the piano, I believe. Exactly. And they wanted uh, they wanted Marn and and I to um, to um, they wanted us to um, just walk through, kind of slowly say goodbye to it all, and it was incredibly <laughs> moving. It was. And, and, and it's a kinda, set kind of crept up on us. I was like, geez, what, what's going to happen yeah. now? And we, uh, we love that apartment. We love working in it and sort of living in it. And um, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It was kind of like saying goodbye to your childhood home or yeah. something. Yeah. Don't tell anyone, but I went into one of the closets. Is Amazon here? I hope not. Okay, I'm I sure they are, but it'll but, be fine. Oh, sorry. I just went in and had like a little scarf that I took home, but I promise I'll return it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you take? The piano? Just, just a memory. <laughs> Tony's not telling. Tony's keeping it very close to his chest. Um, but I, I think it's also that season is, ends up being so much changed because they both end up finding new vocations and, and Abe ends up sort of going into theater criticism um, in a way, which is like kind of fascinating for an actor. I mean, you're someone who's acted on stage, you have a Tony. Um, were you surprised that they said that he would become a critic or be exploring being a critic? I, I was kind of surprised. Uh, but on the other hand, they... They, they, they certainly did the groundwork in a couple episodes uh, before when we, when I worked with, um, with Jason Alexander. Uh, he was his character was an old friend, and he was a playwright, and and uh, I, uh, I thought, why the hell not? I mean, w you know, Abe has been trying t for a season and a half to, to kind of, you know, explore his his, his his past, his youth. And, and reinvent himself, and I just thought I could, and, and I have a kind of a, as all actors do, a sort of deep and complicated relationship with critics. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought this will be an interesting way to resolve, and it's gonna be like a mini therapy session where I can you know, kind of explore and, and uh, maybe come to peace with some, make some peace with with all the bad reviews I've gotten it's in funny, my life. It's funny, before, we, when we were waiting to come out with you, we were talking about magazine, Vulture, New York Magazine, and uh, one of the wonderful, our publicist was talking about how much she loves it, and I didn't have the heart to tell her that I had my very worst reviews in New York Magazine. One of them said, she's wonderful until she opens her mouth. <laughs> That's okay, though, I learned a lot uh, after that, and I um, didn't read reviews. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're off the hook. As a representative of New York Magazine, I apologize. No problem. <laughs> it was, um, they, they, they say nice things too sometimes, right? D do you read your reviews just out of curiosity? Do you, <laughs> do you read your reviews in real life? I used to, but then about, um, God, I want to say about <sighs> 35 years ago, I just, uh, I just stopped. Yeah. I just, I went cold turkey because I just couldn't, uh, it was it was it was too difficult. It'll be interesting they, to see if in the next season, what kind of reviews, if if this character pursues it, what kind of reviewing he does, you know. Yeah, Abe does seem like he'd be a pretty tough critic. So I, I, I imagine I the, think, the yeah. actors of the fictional Maisel universe are in for some in for some drubbing. <laughs> yes. Do you feel like the therapy of, of playing a character who is a critic has, has it helped you gain gain a new awareness or? 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's what's so great about this show. It's it's not just a job. It's it's sort of like a, it, it it's it's kind of like an a, a, a personal yes. in, adventure, a personal yes. quest in a way. That's so true. So my character, I am allowed to tell you because you all know that at the end of the third season, there's that exquisite scene where Rachel comes bombarding me about having talked to Benjamin, right, and sort of trying to set him up, and what, what, you know, what right did I have to get involved? And then she, Rose, says, wait a minute, you have no idea what I am and what I'm going through, and I'm not going to depend upon a man, I'm just like you. You know, I say, we don't see eye to eye by, about a hell of a lot of things, but we do on this one. And so as that sort of begins the next season, it does open this idea of her possibility of making a living, right, as a possible... You all know, right, as a possible, am I allowed to say yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, matchmaker. a matchmaker. Yes. And the funny thing is, and I'm not joking, I do it all the time now, everyone I meet. We can talk about this later if any of you are interested, <laughs> but I swear, oh my God, there's so many people. She's I got, swear, I've thought about this. I've actually got in touch with a lot of the kind of high-powered New York matchmaking systems, and there's some of them have this depth of history that go back in a way that I think is back to connected of the 1950s. And uh, these dating sites, you know, what is it called? Go Cupid, all that stuff. I don't think they have it down the way Rose knows how to do it. <laughs> so I've been successful in three. We'll see three. how it goes. Yeah, it will oh take my gosh. Yeah. I, was, I was going to ask, like, so, so three. Oh, Marin has, I don't know, I'm not allowed to say how Rose. Oh, no, 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 not Rose. But, but Marin has, has had set up three people successfully. Yes, I have. So wow. you can talk to me later. I've done fairly well. Was that, was one that before? One the... didn't work. Okay. Was that before Rose started on this? Yes, actually, I wondered, you know, there was a little moment. This happens sometimes where you wonder if the people writing for you have done, like, a deep dig to see if, like, <laughs> there's a way that they, it's something you did. So, yes, I have a few that I was very, very proud of. I can talk to you about it later. One that's actually a big theater director that said to me, I just want a Jewish doctor. And I said, I have one that I know. And I introduced them, and they've been together 25 years. So, but anyway, nonetheless, it, it was very rose, and, and I don't think Amy and Dan knew that. <laughs> well, I'll follow you up with you about this after the panel, yeah, we'll you, talk you know, about if you have any it. leads. You know. um, I would, but I also wanted to talk about, I mean, the show, speaking of the production design, is so much also in the costumes. And it feels like Rose and Abe have started off in one place and sort of ended up moving. I was thinking of Abe being in Miami and suddenly wearing patterns. And you're like, this is a new world for him. How have you talked with you know, the costume designer, with Anne and Amy and Dan, about how these characters' looks have changed? Well, we are just blessed with uh, a genius uh, costume designer, Donna Zakowska. Uh, she is uh, extraordinary. Again, uh, comes from the theater, uh, so she's a total collaborator and visionary, and so uh, is always in, di in dialogue with us. But um, it it's makes our job so much more, so much easier and so much more interesting to, uh, to be graced by, by her vision and by her taste and uh, as much as the writers, honestly, she drives and guides our, our character choices. Absolutely. I have um, many, many uh, fittings before you actually get to see what you see on screen. Probably each look has gotten four different meetings with the designer and then also with the people who are draping and then doing one or two fittings. And I have to say, each time I do it, I kind of let myself reflect on the way the corsets and the way the bras are different and then the hats and the whole thing. And it was amazing, I love this, is Donna has to kind of get the okay before you can walk on set. And sometimes she'll take my hat and literally like move it like one inch to the right and be like, no, 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 one inch to the left and then, then two inches to the left. And then it, it's like got the blessing before you go out. And if she happens to see that it was like moved a little bit, you can see like her whole face is like turning red and she's like having a hard time because it's like the level of perfection, and I'm sort of joking, but the level of perfection she has is so extraordinary. I mean, the matching color or the 25 different versions of pink and rose and like she has has a whole idea about how the colors bring you forth to a new dimension in your own life. It's amazing. It's yes, amazing it's, it's the attention to detail, as Marin suggested. You know, it's it's for the men. It's all about you know, uh, which how many buttons on this cardigan should be. <laughs> what about this? How many times you want to roll that sleeve up? And you know, things that you would think would be arbitrary and meaningless. But when she's when you when you sort of are witness to her focus and her, uh, you know, her high standard. It, it, you realize, oh, of course, it has to be, 
It has to be here and not here. Uh, that's perfect for this moment. It's perfect for this scene. And so, it, it's again, it's it's a uh, it's just another sort of another arrow in the quiver of of. Uh, of working on these characters, it allows for a kind of elegance that uh, you you know you don't have to you, you don't have to really think as an actor like how do I put it on because when you're fitted that way, it it you sort of have to like move within it as a character. Have there been costumes outfits that you think have most defined how much Abe and Rose have changed? Say sort of in the later season where you were like they they may, would never have worn this, but suddenly I understand this character has gotten this far. Well, I think certainly in season three for Abe, it was when he's sort of trying to recapture his uh, volatile uh, youth, his period in his 20s when he was, you know, a bit of a, a rebel, a bit of a communist. Uh, and so the, he starts wearing turtlenecks mm -hmm. and, and hanging out with beatniks. And, and those kinds of, those, that kind of a... Uh, f change and that kind of a feeling is those are those were the significant moments or the beret in in Paris mm -hmm. um, the, the scarves and things like that uh, all of all of those elements are, are uh, you know just kind of just like my, my character my character remember she went to Columbia and started taking classes there they gave me these sort of youthful jumpers and I honestly felt like I got to go you know from whatever age you could say I'm playing I could tell you my age in my 50s suddenly it felt like Rose wanted to feel younger and so the way Donna decided to do it was to fit her clothing in a whole new form right and I love how she does that she allows you know th that again that kind of detail to, to inform how to make the choice and I think also, especially in the third season, so much of um, Midge's arc was also tied up with Lenny Bruce, with Lou Kirby's character. And I was interested in how you thought about the parents approaching what they feel about him, because it becomes so volatile with what they feel about comedy and, and that dynamic. Well, that yeah, that's an interesting, um, I, I don't know how much I can I know, reveal right, here. Right. Oh, no. Um, that's right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think they're so Abe and Rose are sort of sort of so much not of that world of that underground world, and uh, so they're fearful and they're overly cautious, they're suspicious, and they're a little horrified <laughs> by you know by these um, elements encroaching on their world and encroaching on their daughter, and uh, yeah, it's it's a complicated dynamic. <laughs> Well, also without teasing too much of the next season, then I was also wondering how you responded when you heard about the end of the third season, which I think is the big sort of shock that, you know, Midge has done so well as a comedian, suddenly she's not going to make it onto Shy Baldwin's European tour. What did, how did you respond to hearing about that sort of? Well, that's actually uh, in season four. Right. It's, yes. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how the season w begins, of course. And so what's interesting is I, I because I knew Amy and Dan were going to have their own ideas of how we were going to uh, respond to it, I didn't even let myself as Rose take it in. So when I watched the whole first three seasons, I was like, Rose is on top of the world on one level that, you know, hopeful, I guess you could say, that her daughter's going to do all right, although she's always skeptical. But <laughs> yeah. I don't think we could tread into those. Oh, no, no. We'll, yes. Uh, we'll, we we, we'll keep that secret. You'll see our response you to what see. happens. You will see. Well, then we also, before this panel, put out a call, since you are both parents and you're playing parents, um, for questions for you to answer in terms of sort of parental advice that we had people email us. Great. Um, and so the first one is, um, how would you advise parents like Abe and Rose, who kids, uh, whose kids may have sudden shocked them by announcing that they're going to go into, say, comedy or a creative career instead of necessarily a safer, um, or assumedly a safer path, like STEM or lawyer or something? Uh, would you like us to answer as ourselves or as Abe and Rose? Oh, well, as yourselves, but you can comment on what I, we, we've seen a little bit of how Abe and Rose would have reacted, so. Go for it. Yeah, uh, well, you know, as a longtime parent of, of two girls, um, y you have to kind of just step aside and, um, and grit your teeth and gird your loins and, uh, and just let you know, let them kind of make their own mistakes and be supportive, of course. But um, what I've come to is that, you know, there, there's only so much 
you can say that they're going to take in anyway. Um, you can't, uh, you can only, <laughs> you only have, much to my chagrin, you only have so much control and it's, that's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. I have an 18-year-old boy, so absolutely nothing I say um, is, is being listened to. But now I understand what happened with my parents when I went to college and said to them at one point, instead of going overseas to do this program that I had told them I was going to do that was like a very intellectual, exciting thing, I turned to them and said, I want to go learn to be an actor, and they were horrified. And so in suits, they ended up taking me to this little acting program that was in Connecticut, and they sat there and watched a group of people go like, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, you know, and like jellyfish, jellyfish, and like act things out. And they were so unhappy, and then we walked into like the, the people that ran the administration, and I remember that they told us how much it was going to cost. And it was equal to going overseas to study in Africa. And I just sat there going like, please, I'm going to learn so much about like saying peanut butter and jellyfish and sure enough like they gave me permission to do it and hence that was the road that began this crazy thing that we do you know now but it, it does I look back and say my god I can't believe my parents allowed me to actually you know follow my heart so I think in, in terms of advice uh, I, I would just you know try to I, I would tell people you have to kind of keep in mind that uh, this is what I've come to anyway is that you know, we love our children, and in our lives, they're they're a huge they're a huge thing. They're they're you know seventy percent or eighty percent of our focus because we're devoted to them and we want to see them be happy and we want to see them thrive. Uh, so, in 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 our lives, in our minds, they're enormous. In their minds, we are. <laughs> this big, they have so many other, uh, you know, things to focus on. Their peers, the outside world, uh, their level of, you know, absorbing and learning and taking in new stuff. And we sort of want to think that there, it's it's equal and that it's mutual. This this level of focus and this level of of attention, and and it's just not. It's right. Am I right? Oh, it's so true. We are. We are Sadly. Yeah. That's right. So, so you have to keep, not lose sight of that idea. Yeah, well, I mean, this is actually one that came in on the side of, of a kid asking about advice for help dealing with your parents, I guess. Um, but parents are notoriously hard to uh, buy holiday gifts for. What are the holiday gifts that you would always appreciate as a parent? Oh, well, sweet I, question. I know, That's not tied to Amazon person. or anything like that. We're supposed no, no, to no, like, no, 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 I don't think so. I mean, sure it's just the scent um, of vulture. Buy. Um, <laughs> Well, I would, I would say, uh, I would sort of uh, subscribe to what my father always said when we got him a gift, which was, take it back. You know, that was, just give you a little in, in, inkling into my uh, childhood. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't really, I'm afraid I don't have any... Uh, um, I have no 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 idea for this. You know, I, I actually in in, li in line with what Tony said about not <laughs> not not allow like children not really wanting to spend time. I think the greatest gift my son could give me now. I wish he were even agreeing to come to watch us today, but he's like, uh, you know, you can tell me about it later. But it would have been nice. Uh, well, it will be nice. Let's I'll put it out there positively. If my my Christmas and Hanukkah and holiday present is, hey mom. Let's spend an hour together. <laughs> that would be great. So maybe that's the great gift that that person should say is that, that good, they good offer point. time to their to their family. Some quality times. Um, well, since we talked a little bit about the next season, we actually have two photos that we can premiere oh. um, from the next season. If we could pull up the uh, first one, um, a first look. Oh God, I mean, speaking of the costume design and 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 the sort of production of this sh of show. Um, and, and, and first of all, I was just wondering, I mean, this is sort of seems like it is in the aftermath of um, Midge losing out on the tour, at least sort of reading the photo. Um, is there anything you can say about the sort of general tone of the season or sort of what, what to expect thematically? Um, I, I, I just did, I'm going to just take this in as if it's like a Renoir, right, painting. I cannot believe, like, our, um, Bill Groom does our design. Um, and, and then, of course, we know, as we talked about, Donna Zakowska is doing the, the costumes. If you look at this picture with all, like, I'm not an artist. Well, I guess, I guess I kind of am as an actor, but I would call that an artist. But you look at, like, how the different blues are all over and the pinks and the reds. How did they do that? Like, every attention to detail. 
I, I will say one thing that, you know, Rose doesn't see a lot of the stuff that, that Midge does. And I, this particular set, I did not see for the whole season until the very end that we were shooting. And then somebody at the end took us in to do publicity. And I walked in and I like was shaking. I mean, th did you have that experience? Did you see it Absolutely visit earlier? Absolutely mind blowing. This is the most exquisite set bar none it, well, except Paris, because that's like I, nobody I, can top Paris. Yeah, that, that, I don't that think we, we got to work I, that we got to work on. And then, just right. speaking in terms of the sort of general process of filming the show, what was it like to return to this world to shoot during COVID? To, to have to, you know, approach the, these jobs as an actor differently? Did that affect your process? Well, we had a very strict COVID protocol that we had to adhere to, but it was it was really uh, we were all so uh, anxious to get back together and to be be working again and to have a have something. But I gotta say, the first few days of shooting were were really kind of tricky. We were all we all felt very rusty and like we were opening our mouths and trying to, you know, speak the words of <laughs> our characters. And it just was not it just didn't feel right. They didn't right. really they didn't allow us, you know, usually you do the scene. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I'm so sorry that the sun is out for you guys. They didn't they um you would do the scene and then they, they cut you cut and then they're gonna relight it, as you all know, and and they wouldn't let us stay on set to keep rehearsing, which is something that we love doing and deepening right. it. And I was told, Okay, exit, you know, this is group A, you you're the actors, leave. And for the entire season that didn't happen. And I do wonder sometimes how will the work um, you know, I, I, we all bonded outside and would call each other and sometimes, you know, outdoors like meet, but it definitely was tricky to not have the same amount of time to rehearse with one another because they needed us to take space. We couldn't have meals together. We couldn't have coffee with each other and, and, and sit by, you know, craft services. So that was all quite complicated. Um, yes. oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just saying we, we were fortunate in that other, unlike unlike some other productions that we heard about, we we did not have to shut down. We went we went six months solid, w and we uh, we just you know we got through the we got through it all. Tested with it. every every day, every yeah. day. And it and it surprisingly, I think it's people are going to be amazed that we uh, when they see the season when they see four, uh, how you know kind of massive and and beautiful it is and. And they're gonna, you know, they're gonna wonder, well, how how did Amy and Dan it's, do it's it? It's unreal. They actually still have. They did not. Um, we're not allowed to say dialed much, back. but we did yeah. not get dialed back in terms of the amount of people. They really wanted to incorporate and use as many people in the workplace as they had in the past years. Um, and then I think we have another photo, um, which is of Rose and Abe um, adjusting to a new sort of lifestyle for them, which involves TV dinners. Um, <laughs> And so conceptually, how are they dealing with their sort of new diets, their new, their, 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 these new food? Have you seen this photo before? No. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, um, <laughs> I, by the way, don't you love that shirt? That, that, you know, again, Donna comes up with this idea of like, let's take two different colors and make this insane, again, don't tell anyone, but I, like, I kind of want to steal that one too. But, um, but it was really funny. Um, you know, the whole thing about eating, and uh, I remember having the TV dinner and sort of thinking, no, this is so much better than a real TV dinner. If this was a TV dinner, I would actually use and do that all the time. Um, yeah, this is, this is Abe and Rose uh, definitely w having gone through uh, a, a massive uh, change in their lives and a, a, a different way of focusing and, and seeing the world. And, and uh, I think it's... Well, just you can just sort of see the sort of it, it's sort of a loosening up of 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 who they were and where they came from. And and those are actual edible dinners. Did you were you eating yes. that on set? Delicious. Yes, <laughs> really good. What, what has your favorite meal been in, in through the course of Maisel that you've gotten to eat on set? Uh, well, they make great meatloaf. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big kugel. Guy, We've had kugel. Oh um, yeah. Brisket. Uh, Hala, um, Amy and Dan are real con connoisseurs of good food, and that was another thing this year. We couldn't quite have, as I said, these kind of big dinners that we would all have together, but we have an extraordinary array of um, food and uh, artistry whenever we have our read-throughs, and so anything that they offer, they're like ice cream and, uh, you know, those cookies that are the black and white cookies and bagels and pastrami and... 
Yeah, we're it's all we're really lucky. good. It's making me kind of hungry. All about the food. <laughs> I mean, it sounds delicious. It sounds amazing. Um, well, thank you both. This has been so oh fun. Oh, thank, thank you. you guys.